Okay, in this module we're going to talk about altered mental states and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Okay. The altered mental states that we'll be looking at is we'll look at some of the mechanisms for assessing the level of consciousness, different kind of scales that we use to see how, how conscious or unconscious somebody is. And then we'll look at the difference and uh, between a confusional state versus dementia. So we'll look at some like deliria versus dementia there. Specifically looking at different pathologies like Alzheimer's disease, um, upper urinary, I'm sorry, urinary tract infections we'll look at because that is also a fairly common cause of, of uh, delirium in elderly people that gets mistaken for a, a Psycho psychological issue and we'll look at things like uh, hypoglycemia okay as in too much blood sugar which we've seen before hepatic failure as in liver failure we've seen that in a little bit of uh, in a little bit of detail earlier modules but we'll look at it more here we'll also look at seizures and the different kinds of seizures Huntington's chorea which is one of those movement disorders it also has has some other function functional deficits along with it and uh, depression in general we'll look at depression in the elderly depression in kids and uh, it seems like there's a lot more about depression on this uh, slide than I mean that makes it look like there's a lot but there's actually not that much depression schizophrenia we'll look at got some uh, great movies on there by the way and the powerpoints for that Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome has to do with the uh, thiamine and the alcoholism. Stroke we'll look at again I think we've seen that before but and then we'll look at Parkinson's disease so let's just kinda move on and talk about well what is consciousness okay this is also from your pre-module activity but uh, it says here a clear state of awareness of self and the environment in which attention is focused on immediate matters as distinguished from mental activity of an unconscious or subconscious nature. Okay, so that's quite the definition there, but uh, it's basically that you are awake and aware and not dreaming is really what that says, right? Okay, so how do we assess that level of consciousness? Well, we have different kinds here. Um, actually, ignore that because that is if you were doing it in the class on this uh, thing here where you would go ahead and review these different sheets and then explain it to the class but uh, obviously we're not doing that right now okay so let's look at our AVPU our assessing level of consciousness on the AVPU and so we're looking at whether or not that patient is uh, these four things alert okay how alert or how how awake is that patient the verbal commands as in, do they understand or follow verbal commands when you tell them to do something? You use painful stimulus, as in, uh, you cause pain to that person to see if they're uh, awake. And then, of course, unconscious is if they do not respond to any of those. So, in the AVPU, you're looking at things, you know, where you can literally uh, find out as you go down the AVPU, as it gets further down, they are less and less conscious on that. Okay? So... The, another one here is the Glasgow Coma Scale used for head injuries and a lot of this is actually very similar to that APU which we just saw. This is uh, pretty old back in the 74 from the University of Glasgow but uh, this is very very commonly used. Okay, So if they um, go through this little scale over here and, and they're going through the scale, okay, so uh, first category here is I oh, I just went right through your thing but is eye opening okay so if if they can open their eyes spontaneously then then that's good they get a lot of points you know they get four points if they can just open their eyes if you say hey buddy are you awake okay if you have to really yell it then they'll go ahead and and three points um, only three points if to get their eyes open you have to cause some kind of pain to that person then that's obviously less points because that's they're less conscious and then if you just simply can't get their eyes open they only get a, a one in the eye opening category okay so then you go verbal response well 
are they oriented? Do they know, you know, the person, place, time, where they're at, and that sort of thing? If so, you know, they get the full five points. If they seem really confused or disoriented, maybe they don't know what day of the week it is or something like that, then, then you know, you'll get the four points, which is, is less. If uh, they're using inappropriate words when you are trying to talk to them, then obviously there's, there's something going on in there and they get less points for that, so we're down to three points if that was the case with their verbal response. And then if it's completely incomprehensible what they're saying, then as in, you know, you don't understand what they're saying, it's not making any sense, then you have to give them only two points. And if, of course, they cannot verbally respond, one point. Okay, keep in mind, as we're adding up these points, you know, wherever you put them on here, then, you know, you're, you're adding it up. And, and people that are in this get a score of three to eight for everything combined are considered in a coma. So obviously these, um, if that was the only two things that they had, but they certainly couldn't be in a coma if they were on that anyway, you're talking about, you know, way at the bottom of the scale here to get a, a three to eight. Okay, everybody gets three because none is three, right? So now we got motor response, all right? So you, you're asking them, you know, to do something with their motor, you know, uh, with their movement. So if they obey, of course, at six, the full points there. If uh, they can localize, oops, sorry about that, then you get five points. If uh, you ask them, you know, or, or their motor response is where they have to flex up or withdraw from you, then uh, less points, okay? Um, so you're saying, you know, where does it hurt? Uh, okay, it hurts over here. Well, touch that, they withdraw, something like that. They, they flinch away, okay? You get abnormal flexion, posturing. Okay, now we're starting to, to get a little bit uh, where it's kind of like the fetal position. Okay, and extension posturing is, is the other one kind of like stiff, like maybe they're going in a seizure or something like that. And then of course there's there's none. So again, you get three points if you hit on none and everything, and then you have to keep it under eight to be actually considered a coma by the Glasgow Coma Scale. Alrighty. Okay, here's some other things. This is the one that uh, you, you tend to see a lot. Oops, sorry about that tend to see a lot with the uh, EMTs will use this one a lot so they're looking at the pearl right so now we're just talking about the eyes so when they're looking at the pearl if you look at you know the pupil right here okay the the, the black part of the eye wow it's I drew the whole eye but there you go so the black part of the eye that's pretty uh, that's a huge big old pupil right there right well that's not really regular in size right that was really big so this is your um, I'm gonna say normal size in this particular case for here and if you can see that one that's not equal right so that pupil is is not equal and uh, it's round in this case but you know sometimes they won't be round they'll they'll have issues there where where the uh, nerves going to the eye will, will make it so that that pupil actually isn't even round and then regular in size again this one's obviously bigger uh, than the other one over there that's a normal size and then they have to be able to react to light so where you where you make one eye you kind of cover it up and see what the other one does and then do the opposite you cover up the this eye and see what that one does okay they should be reacting equally to light okay. as far as impaired consciousness goes the whole idea between, behind, behind this reticular activating system is that it's kind of the thing that kind of keeps you going, all right? So maintaining alertness requires intact function of your cerebral hemispheres, as in the two parts of your brain, the left and the right, and preservation of arousal mechanisms in the reticular activating system, okay? So if you look at this reticular activating system, what it is, is an extensive network of nuclei, as in uh, where the nerves kind of start from, and interconnecting fibers in the upper pond. So if uh, you got the midbrain or the uh, the brainstem here, then you know the ponds is where it all starts. So in the upper ponds here, you have these interconnecting fibers in this area, and uh, then you go up to the midbrain, and then you go into the diencephalon area okay so it's, it's going through the entire part of the brain starting in the brain stem down here and uh, to have these these uh, 
fibers, the, the blue ones that are all over the place, connecting to each other, and that just means that you're conscious. If uh, they can't connect to each other, that's going to severely limit the, the somebody's consciousness, okay? So a coma, just a state of altered arousal characterized by extreme unresponsiveness from which a patient cannot be aroused and absence of voluntary movement, okay? So again, it looks like somebody's just sleeping, right? That, except that you can't wake them up. So the mechanism, okay? Again, the reason we brought up that reticular activating system is because something in it is messed up. So mechanism bilateral, as in two sides, cerebral hemisphere involvement or the reticular activating system itself is messed up, okay? So to be in a coma, you have to have both sides of the brain involved or that reticular activating system is just not connecting with each other. Okay, so why do you get that? Well, okay, some of these duh, structural disorders as in, you know, you have maybe a tumor is uh, making you go into coma because of something that's pressing on, likewise an abscess or, or a hole eating into something. Maybe there's some kind of hemorrhage or, or bleeding into the brain, a hematoma, maybe because of concussion, you know, that you just totally knocked yourself completely out or put yourself in a coma because you got hit too hard, okay, which would knock out the reticular activating system in some cases. Now, if you look at non-structural things, as in meta metabolic factors, where, you know, that, that some kind of chemical or something like that going on in your body that has to do with your metabolism, okay, now we're talking about diffuse damage, which means all over the place, okay? So DKA is diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a good example of something that could actually put you in a coma because of the, the, the ketones and the extremely acidic state of, of the diabetic state of ketoacidosis. The hepatic encephalopathy, okay? So hepatic means liver and the cephalopathy, encephalopathy uh, means brain, right? So this is something, again, it's extremely, extremely uh, severe when that, uh, that uh, poison filter of yours in the kidney is, is causing a, a, a brain encephalo problem, okay? Hypercalcemia, if you get too much calcium, or for that matter, if you get too much CO2, then those can definitely cause you to go in a, in a coma state because again you know too much CO2 that would end up in um, a very very severe acidosis and too much calcemia would actually possibly even even stop your 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 brain from functioning because of the calcium that's that's uh, needed but if you get too much of it then it could actually cause the, the axons not to be able to fire like they're supposed to, okay? Hypoglycemia is in not enough sugar. Okay, you've heard of that, low blood sugar. You could literally go in a coma from that. It's one of the major problems of uh, people overdosing themselves on insulin accidentally. Okay, not enough salt or sodium for natremia in the blood. Uh, obviously, not enough oxygen, hypoxia. Uh, the myxedema that we have seen way back when we were talking about uh, uh, what we were talking about, maybe hypothyroidism, okay? Uremia, as in too much uric acid in the blood. Different infections could cause you to go to a coma. Hyper or hypothermia, as in you're getting too hot or too cold. And then um, there's, there's sedatives, um, that could cause you to go in a coma. Of course, uh, overdose means you know, too much sedatives, too many sedatives. Okay, of course, that could put you <clears throat> in a uh, coma. One interesting thing it says down here about the reticular activating system is that it responds to stimuli except for smell. Smell won't cause activity in the reticular activating system. So you're asked, well, why do smelling salts bring someone back to consciousness? Well, the difference is, is, or the reason, is not because of the smell, but because the smelling salts burn, it's ammonia, and irritate the nasal mucosa, okay? Does that make sense? So it's like fire alarms also. They need the noise and the light to wake us up because the smell of smoke alone will not actually stimulate the reticular activating system. Okay, now that doesn't mean that you can't wake up from, you know, from sleep or something and 
and you smell something, it's just that technically smell should not be waking you up through the reticular activating system. Okay, look at the acute confusion or delirium versus dementia. Okay, now if we had to look at these two things and uh, kind of draw a general, you know, why are they different kind of thing because you're both, uh, you're, you're definitely both out of your mind a little bit in, in a lot of cases. But uh, the difference is, is deliria, delirium or delirious, being delirious, tends to be something that's kind of temporary, right? Um, so if it's something like temporary, like maybe you have a really acute infection that's happening right now, or maybe it's a, a reaction to a drug or medicine that you used, or maybe your vascular system, you know, arteries are, are, are uh, expanding or contracting, dilating, constricting something too bad or too fast, and uh, maybe it's something, you know, metabolic. Maybe you got some kind of, you know, metabolic issue going on where you have way too much thyroid hormone and it's actually making you delirious or maybe it's because you know you're again your your liver or something like that with hepatic encephalopathy okay um, you can certainly be deficient in certain things that will cause you to get delirious like water for example okay your endo endocrine system as in hormones if they can if they go uh, in some cases where if your hormones are uh, too high or, or even too low, it could put you in a state of acute confusion, okay? Uh, Post-surgery, especially in the elderly, I mean, they give you medicines, anesthesia, to, to knock you out pretty well, and, and most people are kind of a bit confused when they wake up out of, out of surgery, especially, you know, with the... Uh, some of the modern drugs where you can talk to somebody they seem like they're fine but then they go back to sleep and they don't remember anything anyway anyway so of course you, you I guess you could do it from being too stressed out or a new environment that's a little bit less uh, metabolic kind of how we we're talking about pretty much if you put all these in one category be kind of metabolic but you know stress in the new environment is certainly another reason or another mechanism by which you could be completely confused and delirious and just kind of out of it. Alrighty? Now, again, like I said, from from the acute confusion, you're, you're talking acute. You know, it's happening right now. It's usually transient where it's going to go away after a little while and, and you just, you know, kind of lost your focus for a, a bit there. And depending on, you know, what the cause is, as you can see, there are many, many causes. So you're looking at it clinically testing to see you know, just asking questions, trying to figure out what is going on with this person because there's a, you know, taking tests, things like that. There are certainly a lot of reasons why someone could be acutely confused, all right? On the other hand, if you start looking at dementia, you know, you hear things like Alzheimer's dementia or Huntington's dementia, um, then these are things that they're not normal, okay? They are not a normal part of your aging. It's just some people do get these diseases which causes them to lose their, their impairment, or it impairs, not causes them to lose, it impairs their ability to, to uh, not be confused, okay? As a good example, of course, is the Alzheimer's disease where, where they may have known you for the last 40 years and now they simply have no idea who you are or something like that, okay? Um, these do tend to be progressive Okay, so whatever is going on in the brain, whether it's, you know, the, the alt Alzheimer's or, or Huntington's or what have you, there is progressive. Eventually it tends to, or it tends to get worse as you go on. There's lots of confusion all the time, memory loss specifically. And even at the very end, you start losing reasoning and judgment, okay, which is a very sad part of these diseases. Testing, of course. Our old, our old standbys, right, the CT and MRI so that you can physically look at something and make sure that you're not diagnosing someone with dementia when really you would find on a CT or MRI maybe some of these uh, problems on this side where, where it, you know, they actually had something going on that, uh, 
that explains the reason that they're having this confusion. Okay, so you're going to rule out is what RO means. Rule out all the other physical and mental causes because, again, dementia is something that is, a, is some kind of disease that we're talking about. Okay, and you want to get rid of all the other temporary things that, that may be causing the symptoms to be very similar. Okay, now let's go a little bit more into Alzheimer's disease here and uh, look at what it is. Okay, well, we know that it is progressive as in it continues. It doesn't get better once it starts, at least not this point in time in, in, uh, in the, uh, this world anyway. But once it starts, it starts destroying the brain and we'll show you some uh, pictures here in the next few slides that <clears throat> that has some pretty clear uh, pictures and, and photos of, of what it does. All right, so we'll see about that that uh, actual brain shrinkage and the increase in the lateral ventricle size. Anyway, this is the most common cause of dementia in the elderly. Okay, so it is extremely common. Okay, and. Uh, now the reason we say suspected genes chromosome 21 is because there is a, a uh, correlation with children with Down's syndrome or trisomy 21 do have a very high chance of getting early Alzheimer's disease. So because of that they think that maybe the chromosome 21 is involved in the mechanism although I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, for sure what that mechanism would be okay now there's a family history in some cases with Alzheimer's again when you get a family history of Alzheimer's disease where your mother or father had it and then um, it runs in the family you're talking about cases that are usually under 50 years old I'm, I don't remember the exact age where they say that well if it's that young it's 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 a, a family history part but if somebody's not getting it till 70 years old that's not the family history part that probably has to do with genetics and probably has to do with your family history that's just unfortunate okay um, I can't even remember why they say not aluminum but apparently somebody thought it was due to aluminum at some point all right the signs and symptoms okay amyloid plaques or beta amyloid plaques is uh, kind of like a, a buzzword for Alzheimer's disease. What they'll do is, again, we'll show it to you on another slide, but you get these beta amyloid plaques that uh, are pretty pretty uh, pathognomonic for Alzheimer's disease. All along with that is the other big buzzword, the neurofibrillary tangles, okay, where you see your your neurons basically get all tangled up. And again, we'll see a picture of that on a future slide here pretty soon. Okay, I think most people are probably fairly familiar with the signs and symptoms, the problems that it causes, right? The memory, where it's your immediate memory that is simply um, not functioning very well, but maybe you can remember something from, you know, 30 years ago, and unfortunately the person that you're looking at, even though they're 30 years older, you may remember them as 30 years younger or something like that with that immediate memory again. Again, judgment is an uh, unfortunate part of Alzheimer's and as well behavior and reasoning that kind of go as the disease progresses and gets further along, then that's kind of how these problems go in order, okay? Usually Alzheimer's, you are talking about people over 65 years old and uh, there's an increased incidence as in new cases of, which is what incidence means, you have new cases or, or more new cases of Alzheimer's disease with people who get head trauma, for example, like Muhammad Ali, you know, a boxer all of his life, and he's a, a unfortunate good example of someone who got Alzheimer's disease. Okay, the, I'm sorry, that's a bad example because Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's, not Alzheimer's disease. Um, anyway, head trauma is another reason that you could get Alzheimer's disease, okay, and obviously Parkinson's too. Okay, low education, and of course I already mentioned Downs, but low education, I did not mention. They say that, and it leads right into this next point here, that the best thing you can do to prevent 
getting Alzheimer's disease is not only living healthy as you age, but intellectual stimulation and social activity as in uh, Alzheimer's is, is one of those things where you use it or lose it. Okay, they say that you continue to decrease your risk of getting Alzheimer's the, the more that you use your, your brain further into your life. So, so don't think, you know, someday you're going to retire and not ever have to think again because unfortunately that's the highest, highest risk factor of uh, not preventing Alzheimer's disease is to just stop thinking. So you always want to do something to stimulate your mind throughout your entire life. Okay. And of course there's um, mental status exams where you are literally just asking the patient questions and, and, and testing their memory and seeing how that works. And uh, CT and MRI, again, you've got to rule out other causes. You don't want to say that somebody can't remember something um, <clears throat> and they have Alzheimer's disease and you don't want to diagnose them with that before you figure out, oh my goodness, he just got hit in the head with a brick or something and he's bleeding inside. Okay. We're going to have to break this one off for now to break up the video length and we'll get back to it in the next one.